uh, jumping into a series. I've uh, been here for a little while. I've got a couple more weeks in this. Your will be done. And today we're going to be in the text. is going to be in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. So if you want to head in your Bibles that direction. Uh, I want to share with you a little bit about, about what happens when you just let God do what God's going to do. And so I want to put you in two different, actually put yourself in two different categories this morning, okay? Are you a, are you a one, grab, grab the bull by the horns kind of person? Or two, leave the bull alone kind of person? And, and most of us will be put in one of those two categories that we're like, you know what? Sometimes you just got to grab life and just steer it the direction you need to go. You just need to take control of a situation and stop being a chicken about the situation. Other people are saying, you know what, it's best just to let things ride out the way that they are. Don't stir the pot, it'll work out in the end. So you're probably, your personality and your life experience will probably lend you to be more of a tendency in one way or the other by, by nature. And it's kind of a fun thing when we appreciate those different personality types and the roles that we have in fulfilling what God has called us to do. There's a great story here today that we're going to read about uh, about David and uh, Samuel's departure and Saul as king and then some other components that come into this and in play and it's neat to see sometimes when someone is listening to God carefully even if they're a grab life by the horns kind of person and God says don't do it this time it's really neat to see what happens when they don't and for people that are just you know what just I'm gonna step out of the way and let this thing go on by I'm not gonna get in the way of a freight train kind of thing uh, Sometimes those folks, if you're one of those folks, sometimes it's proper to step in and do something. And we see both things occur in the story today. We see a, a grab life by the horns kind of guy not do a thing. Just, just chill this time. You're just going to relax and just see what God does. And then we see a lady that's really kind of a stay out of the way kind of person step in and risk her life because she was prompted by God to do so. So these role reversals occur in this story today, and it's amazing to me to see what happens when sometimes we step out of our personality type, our comfort zone for ourselves, and we do what God calls us to do in spite of what we would normally do or our circumstances. So for you, you might look at a particular circumstance and you're like, your, your, your MO is like, don't get involved. Just, just leave it alone. Just let it go. Don't, don't step on that one. Just stay away from it. If there's a fight, stay out of it. If there's an argument, don't involve yourself in it. If there's a conflict, go around it. And sometimes that's what God has called you to do with your personality type, with your role in life, your place in the, in the, in the other relationships that you're in. And it's perfectly appropriate. But I would encourage you to don't be afraid from time to time when God prompts you to step in out of character for yourself and say, this is what God has called me to do. And the neat thing is when you do that, the praise and the glory doesn't go to you. It goes to God for what you did. And the, also the opposite applies. If you're, a, if you're a get it done kind of guy or a get it done kind of girl and people know that you're an, you're an action oriented person, and when something comes your way and opposes you or challenges you or the situation that you're in or your family or your finances, your job, and you just say, you know what, this time I'm hearing God, just be still. That's what I'm hearing in this one. And your friends and family are like, what? Well, what is this be still stuff? That's not you. I know, I know. But this is what God has called me to in this situation so that God will get the glory and, and not me. So you may be on one side or the other of that. And I just want to share that as the pretext for today's uh, reading in, in 1 Samuel chapter 25 as we look through this. So let me let me catch up from last week. We were in 1 Samuel chapter 17. That is the, the passage that most people know. If you didn't know any other passage in 1 Samuel, you knew chapter 17. It's the, it's the passage where it is recorded that David kills uh, this Philistine giant named Goliath. Saul becomes jealous of this in the next few chapters because the people come back and recognize that David is the one that saved the battle this time and, and led the charge for this particular battle where uh, the nation of Israel triumphed and, and inflicted huge casualties on the Philistine army. And they came back. Saul becomes jealous over this as a king. He's kind of insecure in his position at this point. So Saul begins to despise David and even attempts to kill him. Uh, it records a couple times that he, David was in, his, uh, in, his, in, in Saul's house, his palace, playing a harp for him to kind of soothe him. He was tormented. And in that, David was playing a harp, and Saul had a spear near him. He took it up and he pitched it uh, to kill David, and he hit the wall. David eluded him, 
And, uh, and this, were, this is where Saul's mind was going right now out of this jealousy. So David begins to run for his life, and he's got about 600 men with him uh, that are pretty crazy loyal to David and his cause. And then in chapter, ch chapter 24, uh, this is an amazing passage, and, and some of you have been there. I've actually been at this location. It's a place called En Gedi. It's down near the Dead Sea in the, in the southern end of Israel, and it's the place where David hid from Saul. In all, there's a bunch of caves there, and then there's a huge waterfall in the middle of the desert. It's this really amazing oasis. If you've ever been there, it's, uh, it's really refreshing. One of the hottest places on the earth, uh, south of the Dead Sea, you're way below sea level. And, uh, and then there's this oasis called En Gedi. And there's all these little nooks and crannies and these little caves as it climbs up this hillside, rugged, rugged hillside. And then there's this beautiful waterfall with an oasis that you can go swimming in if you go there and, and you take the tour down to that part of the country. And this is where David finds himself being hunted by Saul. And the, and the Bible is pretty graphic at times. It's kind of a funny thing that it's just like real. And it says, it says that Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. Well, he had to go potty. And that's just really what the Bible says. And while he was going potty, he took off his outer robe and set it aside. And then he went and did his business. And David was in the back of this cave. So there's Saul in a very vulnerable position. Uh, David could have come out and just killed him because I'm sure that he unstrapped his sword along with that. So David could have killed him. But instead of killing him, he just cuts off a piece of his, 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 his hem of his, his robe and he slips back into the darkness of the cave without Saul knowing this. And then a little time later, David climbs up to the top, and it is a climb to the top of this thing. And Saul, uh, apparently, Saul went to the lower regions in, in the valley floor down there, and David calls to him and said, I could have killed you, and I didn't. Stop hunting me, please. Saul repents at that point, but doesn't mean it. And then the, 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 the text picks up in chapter 25 and verse 1. We'll begin our reading there. It says, Now Samuel died. I don't want to overlook this. It's only three words, but it's a significant piece of Israel's history. Samuel was a, was, a, was a prophet. Samuel was a priest. He ruled Israel for a time, and he was a man of God. He was the one that the nation was led by uh, in very positive ways, and then he was the one that God called to anoint Saul as king. And all Israel assembled and mourned for him. This was a national event. This was a big, big deal. And they buried him in the house of Ramah at his house in Ramah. And David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. This is in the south. And there was a man in Maon whose, name, whose business was in Carmel. That's a city down there. And the man was very rich. He, and it gives the, the quanti quantity of his wealth. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. This is the time of festival when the sheep get sheared. Time of rejoicing when the harvests come in. Now the name of the man was Nabel. And the name of his wife was Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name, and thus you shall greet him. In other words, this is how you're supposed to talk to him. Peace be with you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did uh, them no harm, and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please, give whatever you have at hand to your servant and to your son David." Then David's men came, and they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. So if you can read the context here, like I read the context of this so far, David's men are held up in a, in a desert region for the most part, and they had protected the shepherds of Nabal down in the regions that they were because there were people that would, that would take the sheep. Uh, there, were, there were nomads down there that were destructive and, and harmful. They would kind of pick away at the shepherds or kill the shepherds and take the sheep. And David's men were down there hiding from Saul, if you would, in this, in this kind of desolate region, and they were obviously seen. And, and we're going to see in just a moment that David and his men never hurt the shepherds. They never stole the sheep. And in fact, it was the exact opposite of how they felt. So 
But Nabal responds to this request of David that at the time of harvest when things were plentiful, they were shearing sheep, that, that all David says, hey, can you, can you just send a few things with the 10 guys that I sent for my men? Would you be able to do that? We have been very kind to your shepherds. We've actually protected them in the desert where the sheep are. Nobody's heard them. We've never taken anything from them. Would you be so kind? And David just asked this request. Well, Nabal is, is not a nice man. He is a hard-headed businessman, and he's not going to give somebody something for nothing. So he responds in such a way that really offends David. And he says, I don't even know who this David is. I'm not going to share my food with him or my crops. Uh, I'm going to send David's men away empty-handed. And then Abigail, uh, Nabal's wife, hears what happens to this. And she's a level-headed woman. It says she's discerning and intelligent and beautiful. Have you ever seen a couple whether it's the husband or the wife, that one seems kind of surly and mean, and the other one is kind of jovial and fun-loving. Yeah, that's kind of a fun mix, isn't it? I mean, when it's a little bit of a mix, it's kind of a fun thing. This was an extreme, where she was the health of the relationship, and he was a stern businessman type of man. So Abigail hears about this and has, uh, has to do something about it. So I'll pick up the reading in verse 14. It says, But one of the young men told Abigail, uh, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and, and he rallied, railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us. This is David's men, the, the fighting men that David had with him in what they called the wilderness. And we suffered no harm. We did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went uh, with them. They were a wall to us both by night and by day, and all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore, know this. And consider what you should do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his house. He is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Wow. So this is one of the, one of the servants talking to Abigail about her husband right now. So apparently she had, a, she had the ear of the people. She had the ear of the people that worked with them, that did life with them. She was a kind and discerning woman. So she responds, in verse 18, it says, Abigail made haste. She didn't, she didn't waste any time once she got this information. It doesn't look like this is in character for her. This is what looks like is way out of character for this woman that's probably distinguished, and the scripture says that she's beautiful, she's intelligent. But it doesn't really look like she's a woman of action at this point. But right here, she acts out of character. And it's a good thing that she does. She made haste, and she took 200 loaves, two skins of wine, five sheep already prepared, five, that would be bushels uh, of parched grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. Guess what she's going to go do? Yeah, she's going to go minister to David's men and, uh, and bring them some relief in, in the desert. So she was a peacemaker. She acted on her convictions. She acted out of character for who she normally would be in her own personality. Have you ever heard anybody say, I was born this way? Have you ever heard that in any context? You know, somebody that's shy, somebody that's outspoken. Um, we've heard it recently uh, in regards to sexuality. Somebody says, I, I was born this way. You know, we've heard those kind of statements in recent years more than ever. Um, I, I agree to some extent that we were born with a bent in life. Some of it is just a sin issue. And when you say, I was born that way, and you justify your sin, you're right. You were born as a sinner, and so was I. I was born with a particular bent for sin. Maybe it's different than your bent for sin. Some things that tempt people don't tempt me at all. I mean, not one bit. And other things that tempt me might not bother you at all. You might be like, why is that a temptation for you? I just don't understand your weakness in that area. And here we have a lady that's kind of reserved and distinguished and intelligent and respected by the people that, that, that work for her husband. And she has their ear. She earned that over a long period of time. She was a reasonable woman. But I don't think she was a woman that acted out a lot, because Nabal was one of those get-it-done kind of guys, so he probably couldn't be married to a get-it-done kind of girl, or they would bump heads a lot. And it doesn't look like from Scripture's text that we have a woman that's that way. But in this time, she realized, listen, we're all going to die if something isn't done. So she takes this peace offering out to David and his men. She was a peacemaker. She acted on her convictions. She met David and explained uh, what kind of man that her husband was. 
And she appreciated the fact that they had, David and his men had protected their shepherds and their sheep. And she brings food for all of David's men as much as she can muster. And I want you to see David's response because what you, what you, what you have to assume here now is that David is a fighter and a warrior. And he just asked, hey, we've been protecting your sheep for a long time and your shepherds. Could you just throw us a little bit? It's harvest time. Just throw some scraps our way. It's, it's not that big of a deal for you. And Nabal says, no, not, not at all. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. It's mine. So David gets offended by this. I want you to hear his response uh, when, when Abigail brings this out in verse 32. It says, David says to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. He's pretty excited about her coming out. Actually, he met her in a ravine. She was walking through a ravine, and, and if you read the text, David's men descended down on her because she had some people with her. And they saw these, uh, these people coming, so they descended down to meet them. And he says, and he says Blessed be your, the, your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed, blood guilt, and from avenging myself with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left in, at Tunabal so much as one male. David's intent was to take his men and kill every man in Nabal's kingdom or his camp or his household. Kill them all. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. In other words, I'm not coming after you, I'm not coming after your husband. Uh, you're good. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you have done. She acted out of character. She did something that was very uncomfortable for her. It's kind of neat to see when God calls us to do that. Have you ever been in that position? Have you ever been called to do something by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, and you're just like, you know what, this is the right thing to do, but it doesn't feel like me. This is what I should be doing, but it's a little scary. This is what I should do, but there's a risk involved in this. Yeah, yeah, we get those nudges all the time. And, and sometimes we just say, well, that's, that's not my character. That's not what I'm, I normally do. That's, that's not how I would normally act. I know, me neither. But sometimes God calls us to do something that's out of character so that when we do it, we don't get the glory for it. He does. And Abigail acted way out of character by doing this. She did something without her husband's permission, which was a really big no-no back in that day. It was kind of a deal. She, she sequestered some of the help that, without her husband's permission that worked for him. She, she grabbed some of the resources that were really his, under his discretion, and she took them, and she took them all to David and David's men. But her heart was to save their lives because she heard from this other servant, your husband is really hard-headed about this. He's going to get us all killed. David and his men were really good to us while we were out in the wilderness, and your husband won't listen to that. David's going to be very upset about this, and he was, and he was coming to kill every male in the household. She stepped out of all that and did what she felt she needed to do before God. Now she tells her husband about this. She's got to go back and tell her husband what she did. Have you ever done the right thing and then had to explain it to somebody that wasn't necessarily going to agree with you that you did the right thing? That's kind of tough, isn't it? That is. You, you, you felt in your heart it was right, but you knew that the person that you were telling wouldn't have had you do that, and, and is probably a little bit opposed to what you did, right? Okay, this happens from time to time in our relationships. The neat thing is here, because Abigail walked closely with the Lord, and her husband did not, is that God protected her in the way that she obeyed the Holy Spirit in this area. It's kind of amazing to see the protection that happens when we step out and do things that are out of character for us, maybe a little scary for us, maybe something that we're not really settled with, but we know that it's the right thing to do. It's neat to see how God brings protection at that time. She was protected from David and his men. They didn't hurt her or harm her in any way. They received the offering that she brought, and they promised more protection on her and her household. And I want you to see the response to this, but I also want you to see the contrast of what happens to Nabal right now because he was hard-headed and he would not listen to, to, to God. He wouldn't listen uh, to the request of David's ten men that came in Psalm and said, hey, could you help us out? We've tried to be really good to you. We could have taken any of your sheep and any of your men and you couldn't have stopped us. We protected you from other, other people that would have been nomadic by nature and, and would have kind of picked away at your herds or killed your shepherds. You know that we did this. We did it day and night. We provided a wall of protection for you. And the ball said, heck no, you're not getting my stuff. I want you to see the end result of this. 
Because sometimes there's somebody that's in the ball's shoes. And they're like, you know what? If you didn't work for it, you're not getting it from me. That's the way it's going to be. Hmm. Some people that give to charitable organizations like churches or uh, ministries that feed the poor or those that bring clean water to villages. If you've ever been to one of those situations, it's an incredibly, incredibly rewarding situation to bring housing or clean water or shelter in a place in the world where there is none. And some people are like, you know, I'm not giving to that. They can take care of themselves. Wow. And here's the result of what happens to Nabal. I want you to see this. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 36. And it says, Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Remember, it was harvest time. Everything was bountiful right now. They were enjoying what they, what they had worked for all year. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. Uh, let me add something to this, if I may. She used a lot of discretion in this. Um, I've had the opportunity over the years to speak to a lot of people that were either uh, under the influence of drugs or alcohol in their crisis in that moment. And I have always, because of this scripture and a few more, I have always refused to have much conversation with somebody that's under the influence. My, my encouragement is, get somewhere safe, sober up, we'll talk tomorrow. Because a, a slobbering drunk in a bad situation, and I've been there on many, many occasions, Many occasions. I was there once after a, a car accident. Somebody was drunk as could be, and they, uh, they almost killed themselves. Bloody mess in an ER. They wanted to have a reasonable conversation. I said, not now. Not now. We'll talk tomorrow. Had a couple men that were so fall down drunk they couldn't stand up straight. Helped them to get in bed. Got them, got them undressed. Put the covers over them and said, stay there till morning. We'll talk then. Some of you are living with a drunk or someone that's under the influence regularly of something. My encouragement to you is to do what Abigail did. She was a wise and discerning woman. Don't try to reason with somebody that's under the influence of something. Get them in a safe place. Talk about it tomorrow. Some of you live in that culture or have lived in that culture. Some of you work in that culture. That's part of what you do for a living. And I would encourage you, whatever the situation is, uh, wait till the influence of a, of a substance or an alcohol is out of the body before you try to reason with somebody. Otherwise, you'll be wasting your breath and your time. Abigail had enough wisdom to do this. You, you, you might have taken the opposite approach. You might have said, well, while he's high in spirits and he's married, maybe I'll tell him now because he's in a really good mood, and then by morning, it'll be okay because he, he'll, he'll settle down. She didn't do that. She waited till he was sobered up, and then she spoke to her husband. And God blessed her for this. Uh, verse 37. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, and his, that means he sobered up, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. That's a weird ending for that to happen. I mean, the story continues, and we'll continue to read it in the next few weeks as this plays along following, really, the storyline follows David at this point. The ball is just one character in it that could have brought relief to David, and he did not. He refused. His wife acted out of character, stepped out in faith, brought relief, and it's amazing to see what happens to her. David and Abigail end up getting married. He ends up taking her as his wife. So I want to share with you something just before we go. In situations in life, you can row with. You know what I mean, right? There's a current. You can row with the current. That brings ease. It brings progression faster than you deserve it because there's a current that's actually giving you something. And you're just rowing with the current. And many times in life, that's a good thing to do. Many times. If you're in a a godly household or a business that's functioning correctly, if you're in a church with proper leadership, your pastors, your ministry leaders, your deacons, you can row with a lot of times, and it helps the greater cause. If you're in a business and you get a directive from the business owner or your manager or your department leader, you want to row with. You want to row with. And then there's times in life you have to row against. You just can't, you can't go along with it anymore. You just got to say, you know, this is, 
this is where I stop rowing in this direction with this group of people or with this person or in this marriage or in this business. I just can't row with anymore. I have to actually row against. And Abigail did that. She rowed against Nabal. Hard. And she risked her own life. He could have killed her for that. In that day, in that age, right there, that culture, that would have been insubordination to the point where he could have had her killed for what she did. She wrote against heart. Doesn't, we don't see any, any indication that that was her character at all. Her character was discerning and wise. And she always just kind of did that role. And now at this point in life, wherever, whatever age she and her husband were at, she, she really was inspired to do something different and to, to row against for a little season. Sometimes that'll be your calling in life. Sometimes it'll be the calling to row against. But be very careful. Because when you row against authority, you can bring judgment on yourself and the people around you. It's a very, very careful thing. I was asked again this week, what would happen, Pastor, if, uh, if what happened in California happens here? I've already made up my mind. That decision's already made. I will obey the Bible over any authority. End of discussion. I would hope that our authority would support Scripture. But when it conflicts with Scripture, my decision is already made. I'm not going to make it on the fly, and I hope you don't either. Abigail starts to row against. All of a sudden, she turns around in the boat, and she starts pulling hard the other way, and risks her very life. And the life of those who helped her, all those servants, would have been killed instantly. If Nabal said, you know what? You did what I told you not to do. You all supported her. Kill them all. Kill them all right now. That could have happened. So rowing against authority is a very careful thing. Very careful thing. You want to make sure we don't become a rebel without a cause. That we are, we're adhering to Scripture closely. And at times, and in our country it doesn't happen often, but if you've traveled abroad at all, there are, there are countries where just the possession of this book is a death sentence. You may not have been there, but there are countries that this is an illegal book to have and they will kill you for having it. So if you and I live in that country, we must row against. If a peaceful assembly becomes illegal in our country, you have to make a decision between you and God. Am I going to row with or am I going to row against? So there's times when we'll row with and we'll row with. And even if we don't like it, if the Holy Spirit, Spirit isn't directing us to row against, continue to row with. I'm sure there were hundreds of decisions that Nabal made that were hard and harsh and Abigail, just being a, a sweet, tender, discerning woman, thought, well, I can't necessarily agree with that, but I, I don't feel led to row against it. I'm, I'm just going to let that go. It's not my place. But this time, she felt the Lord is petitioning her to do this. So she did. And she rowed against. Maybe you're having a hard time rowing with right now because you want to row against, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't. And maybe now's the time when you've been rowing with for a long time and you need to row against. And it's hard, scary. And then there are times in life when you take your oar out of the water and you just become still. And you let God be God. For me, that's the hardest part. If you are, if you are a similar personality type to me, it's easy to row with or against. Make up my mind, just do it. Just go. Just pour into it 100%. But to actually be still and allow God to be God in my life, and to do nothing one way or the other. Just to allow the sovereignty of God to work in my life and those around me. That's the hardest thing for me to do, just to pick up the oar out of the water and set it across my lap and say, okay, your will be done. I heard your voice. You don't want me to row with or against in this situation. You want me to be neutral and watch you do what you do best without my contribution. That's a hard thing. Now, maybe for you, that's the easiest thing. Maybe you like to be the non-participant. You don't want to be for or against. I'm not going to confirm or deny. Maybe that's your thing. Maybe you're the one that needs to put the oar in the water at this point and make a decision on whose side you stand. See, these are all decisions that are made within us. And when you and I walk closely with the Holy Spirit, convicting us, correcting us, encouraging us, comforting us, these are decisions that are easily made from within. But they're hard to live out sometimes. 
And like I've said on many occasions right here, people won't always let you feel good about doing the right thing. Some people will try to make you feel horrible about doing what God wants you to do in your life. Some people will punish you for doing what God has convicted you to do in your life. Some people will leave you for doing what God has called you to do in your life. But in the end, God will bless you for doing what he called you to do. I see in the end of the story clearly that Abigail was blessed beyond belief. She was given a husband that loved her to pieces, that was a warrior, that listened to God. He wasn't a harsh or hard man. She did well. God avenged David. He took Nabal's life without anybody having to raise their hand to him. Hmm. See, sometimes we just need to be still. And David just let it ride. He didn't do a thing. He's a warrior. He's a fighter. He had his sword strapped to his side. He was ready to go kill every male. And then Abigail came and said, don't row for, don't row against, just be still. And for one of the few times in David's life, he just sat still. 600 men, bloodthirsty men saying, come on, let's go take care of this guy. We took care of his sheep. We took care of his people. We were kind to him. And he stiffs us like this when we, when we have some knees right here in the desert trying to survive. And he won't help us. David said, let's be still right now. Let's just take the oar out of the water for a little while and see what God does. Like me, you're involved in situations in life every day. And in a given day, you may have to row with, row against, and sit still in all different situations. In a given day. So in a week or a month or a lifetime of parenting or in your work world, sometimes it's in your health. Sometimes it's time to stop seeking doctors. Sometimes it's time to find doctors. Sometimes it's time to just be still and let God do what he's going to do. In relationships, sometimes it's, it's to pursue someone and to seek restoration and forgiveness and go help them. Sometimes it's time to get away from them and, and put some distance between you and someone, some toxic people in your life. Sometimes it's good just to sit still and say, Lord, your will be done. Knowing the difference between those three is, is amazing. I, I, uh, I, I go back to this. It was kind of neat. I've, I've celebrated recovery with a bunch of people over the years that have celebrated the mile marks in, in recovery. And I love the serenity prayer, you know. And it says just that. There's times to step in and do something. There's times to do nothing. And there's wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> And that's a really great time in life when we start to understand that and we stop acting impulsively or out of emotion that drives us. It's great when we can just say, God, I know what I want to do in this situation. I know what I feel like doing. I know what I'm compelled to do now. But what would you like me to do in this situation right now? And if a group of people would begin to ask that question of God right in the middle of it and frequently, what would be the results of a group of people like, like us? What would God do with and through us if we began to be so pliable in his hand that we know when to row with, row against, and when to just be still? I want to pray for you because this week, you're going to smile, but I imagine this week, in your life and in mine, there'll be times when you'll recall this and you'll be like, ah, now I have to consider this. I can't just do what I've always done. I can't just do what, what's in line with my, my personality type. I actually have to think about this now. Is this a time when I act for? Is this a time when I oppose? Or is this a time when I just, I just let, let it go and just see what God does without my intervention? So I want to pray for you right now for this week and, and, and the rest of your life as you consider this right now. When you understand when your influence is needed to promote a cause or a situation, when you need to oppose it even if it's alone, or when you just need to step out and say, this has nothing to do with me, I'm supposed to be in the grandstands, not on the field of play in this situation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the day that you've given to us. Thank you for the time that we could be here right now. Lord, we're going we're gonna to get out of our seats in a moment and, and uh, have, maybe have some conversation and leave this building and go on with our lives. So I pray that this time, this hour that we've had together impacts us for the rest of our lives. That this passage of scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 25, the, the acts of a brave warrior David when he stood still, the acts of a, 
of a discerning and wise woman, Abigail, when she risked everything to save her family. Lord, I pray that we see that sometimes acting out of our own particular character is exactly what you want us to do. Lord, there are times when we'll act in our character, more often than not. And Lord, give us the wisdom when to take our hands off the situation and to watch you do amazing things. Lord, be with us this week. I pray that doing this, this exercise in our life, I pray that this grows our faith like crazy. I pray that we're patient enough to see you move slower than we thought you should, <laughs> but thoroughly. And uh, that you would bring some things to fruition in our lives that we've been praying for for a while. Lord, bless us as we serve you this week. Watch over us till we meet again. In Jesus' precious name, amen.